The Unshackled Waves, episode 222. Broadcasting from Melbourne, Australia, this is The Unshackled Waves with Tim Wills. Brought to you by theunshackled.net. Hello everyone, great to have your company. Now we've met many Patriot activists in our time on The Unshackled. It takes a lot of courage, determination and perseverance to be in this line of activism. It's unpaid, you attract the attention of various government authorities and leftist activists, your social media is often censored, and the media, cultural and political class label you a racist and an extremist. Often we are focused on the Melbourne Patriot scene as it's where we are based and it's where such activism is needed most, but there are Patriot activists and groups all around Australia which are also worthy of coverage. One Patriot activist who has been particularly active over the summer period is Dennis Hutz from Perth. His Facebook video on African crime hitting Perth has been viewed over 450,000 times and he unveiled an It's OK To Be White banner at a Big Bash cricket match in Perth Stadium and also had a confrontation with Invasion Day protesters in Perth on Australia Day. To give us a first-hand perspective on all these events, as well as learn about the Patriot scene over in the West, we are lucky to be joined by Dennis today. Dennis, welcome to the show. Good, Tim. Good to be with you. Now, I'm based here in Melbourne, and mm. I seem to think that that's where all the nationalist activism is, and we've got a pretty vibrant nationalist scene here in Melbourne, but there's nationalist activism occurring all around the country, including in, in Perth, and you were involved uh, when the, the United Patriots Front was, was at its peak, even though uh, that was also based in Melbourne. It had branches all around Australia, including in Perth. So can you describe, obviously, the, the founding of the, the UPF in, in Perth and what sort of activism you engaged in? Well, when you say all around Australia, I think it was pretty much basically Melbourne with uh, an offshoot here in, in Perth, which was ours. Um, the reason that you have so much nationalist activism in Melbourne is because that's where the most resistance is needed because Melbourne is like a total left-wing basket case state. And Perth is going that way um, largely also. Um, I don't know, in 2015, I just sort of started noticing the Patriot movement and I started to uh, make some videos. I did one uh, on the Fiona Stanley Hospital and the UPF guys saw it. I started uh, putting the UPF logo on my Facebook page and uh, got into talking with the guys. And in 2015, they came over to the rally, the Reclaim Australia rally, and I met up with them then and basically started a chapter here uh, with me heading it and uh, it really took off there for a while. But um, you know, once Facebook shut us down, we we're pretty reliant on social media, like all of the groups are. And once you once you denied access to that, then um, it doesn't leave you with a lot to work with. Um, but that's pretty much how I came into the the Patriot movement and the UPF. It's interesting that you say Perth is going the the same way because as Melbourne, because there's this perception that. Perth over in the West that they're much more uh, conservative. Obviously, you had uh, Colin Barnett as Premier for, for nine years. He was considered uh, quite conservative. The, the Liberals hold, I think, 11 out of the, the 16 uh, seats. A and so it's, it's always seen as that the, the West is, is more conservative, but that's, that's not how you see it on the ground there. Well, it has always been a very safe Liberal state. Um, federal elections, um, the Libs have always known that WA is a, is a safe place for them. Um, and you're right, with Colin Barnett, um, that's the way it was. We've got a new guy, Mark McGowan, and he seems to be sort of a, a copycat of Daniel Andrews in Victoria in many ways. There was the road highway project that was happening over here. I don't know if you heard about it. Where, yeah. Yeah, McGowan basically caved to uh, the sort of neo-Marxist uh, council of Fremantle run by uh, Greens activists, um, the mayor and his whole board are just Greens activists. These guys were getting, the, 
the board themselves were getting arrested down at Row A, chaining themselves to uh, bulldozers and fences and stuff. And um, McGowan just caved to them. You know, Barnett had all the approvals. It was going ahead. The, the land had been cleared. And as soon as McGowan came in, he just, he just gave it away. Not only that, McGowan's bringing in um, what was called the Safe Schools Coalition. It's now been renamed. I think it's called Inclusive Schools. Yeah, I saw yeah. that. That was classic uh, rebrand. Re it is. It's the uh, anti-bullying, uh, the sort of radical gender masquerading as an anti-bullying program thing. You know, you've got it in Melbourne too, don't you? Uh, yeah, we have the the full uh, Rosward Marxist uh, safe schools. So, yeah. so WA and with the third world immigration that we've got here, we're starting to look a lot like Victoria, uh, unfortunately, yes. Uh, the Victorian disease is, is spreading, it, 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 is. it seems. It is. Uh, I, I often say to uh, people from, from, from other states that, well, it looks like you're heading the, the same way. I've said that to Queenslanders. I've said that to people in, in New South Wales. I think it's becoming an Australian disease. Well, a Western country, the disease of all Western nations, really, America, Europe, um, Australia, it, it's all going the same way. There's this constant sort of like tightening a bolt further and further to the left where society is becoming just gradually but slowly further and further shifting towards the left. Um, all of the institutions of Western civilization are now controlled by communism, by you know what we call cultural Marxists where, uh, you know, the catch cry is always humanitarianism, humanitarianism and liberating the oppressed, uh, but it's always just a smokescreen for their true agenda, which is the implementation of sort of radical left-wing ideals. And they try to make you think that the people are in agreement with the institutions, and by the institutions I mean politicians, media and education. They're the ones who constantly push this narrative of left-wing uh, progressive idealism, and they want the rest of the country to they, want to, they want to sort of make everyone believe that the people feel the same way as they do, but the people don't. Um, I would say that the majority of Australian people are patriotic people, people who um, love their national institutions, people who want to just get up and go to work, watch their kids play sport on the weekend, live in a safe and viable society, uh, and they don't want to see their country uh, change in the way that radical leftists are trying to change us. It's only the people who are sort of the custodians of the institutions of Western civilization who are doing that, not the people. Uh, if the people had ever been given a voice on these on the big issues, we would never have gone down the road that we have gone down. Well, I certainly hope that the people do uh, come with us, but it, it's, it's certainly proving to be a challenging thing. I mean, Victoria is the perfect perfect case. We had four years of a far left uh, government where we talked about safe schools. He tore up a, a road a contract. Uh, we had the, the African uh, crime wave and it, it, he still got re-elected in a landslide. Yeah, you're right. Victoria's a bit of a different case, I guess, isn't it? But, uh, I would still argue that generally, overall, the majority of Australians and the majority of all people in Western nations uh, don't hold far-left uh, radical views. Well, part of the difficulty is getting the, the message out, and you uh, talked about before that the, the UPF, they were completely deleted from Facebook. It wasn't just the main page which had 120,000 likes, but all the state-based pages as well. And that pretty much made the UPF sure. uh, collapse. It did, thanks largely to what we believe was the pressure put on Facebook by the Victorian state government. We strongly believe that um, the Victorian establishment had a hand in doing that because we were getting too big, too popular, too strong. Can you imagine if we hadn't have been shut down? Yeah. Where, where that page would be at now. I mean, it's, you know, you can only wonder where we would have gone. Um, and, and that's the way social media is, you know, it's, um, it's a voice for leftist ideals. And if you speak anything contrary to that, then you're branded as hate speech and uh, they'll shut you down. 
Now, there was a few groups that emerged uh, post-UPF. Uh, the, the most prominent was the, the Lad Society, which uh, was made up of a lot of former uh, UPF uh, members, and that also established branches and uh, sometimes clubhouses in, in other states. And I do know that there was a Perth branch or uh, chapter active in, in Perth. Uh, did you have much to do with it? Not a great deal. I've, I know some of the guys that are in it, and I have what you might call a, a loose association with them. But um, you know, generally, I just sort of do my own thing these days. Um, I've got a, I've got a Facebook page up, and from time to time, I'll do something on it if I see it um, as worthwhile. But uh, yeah, I'm not I'm not really affiliated with groups anymore. Is there other people that you work with when you're when you're doing your your activism? Unfortunately, in Perth, and I think it's the same in Melbourne and, and Sydney too. Um, a lot of people online are passionate about nationalist ideals. But when it comes time to you know roll the sleeves up and get things done, you can't always find people. Uh, there are some people here in Perth. Um, I'll give a shout out while I'm here to. Uh, Craig, who heads uh, Reclaim Australia WA. Uh, Craig and I do a lot of activism together. He helped me do the um, the flag, at the, the banner at the cricket, the It's OK to be white banner at the cricket. Um, if you're watching, mate, good on you, Craig. Um, you're always uh, ready to do it. But um, no, I don't anymore have a consistent group of people who are ready to do things. So just kind of go out on my own if, if there's something that needs doing. One thing I wanted to discuss with you, because obviously it takes uh, some time for, for news to filter through uh, from the West to here, but there was a incident that, uh, that occurred uh, last year with the murder of Alan Taylor by uh, two uh, self-described uh, white supremacists who um, bludgeoned him to death uh, with, a, with a hammer. That was done by uh, Melanie Jane Atwood, who was the leader of Aryan Girls, and her boyfriend Robert Edhouse, who was the president of Aryan Nations. And that was used to discredit the, the nationalist movement or in Perth, but obviously in general. Um, are you able to put some context on were these people connected with the nationalist movement or were they pretty much fringe people? Yeah, they were fringe people. And a lot of those kind of groups um, have tried to latch on to the Patriot movement and come along to rallies, um, but they were never a part of the general Patriot movement. Um, with regard to that, what you were just talking about. So, yeah, there's been a lot made of it. The left, um, you know, Slack Bastard uh, particularly has been very vocal on it and tried to make some sort of a connection between the United Patriots Front and the, that group, the Aryan Nations, and that murder. Um, and there is absolutely no connection between us. And the, the, the thing that they focus on is, I was talking earlier about in 2015 when the Melbourne UPF guys came out uh, essentially, it was to come out and meet me and started the UPF and WA. And they came, they flew in on the morning of the rally uh, in 2015, and they flew out on the same night, late, uh, around midnight, I think it was. And the rally wound up sort of in the afternoon, and the guys just needed a place to, um, you know, sort of chill out uh, and wait until I took them to the airport to get their flights back. And um, somehow or other, we ended up being asked to go back to a house uh, in the Perth suburb of Girawing. Um, and someone, uh, and Melanie was there. It was the house that was owned by Melanie's um, former partner, Alan Taylor. Um, and we went there and we stayed there for a couple of hours and then we left and I took the guys to the airport and I went home. Now that was the only time that I'd ever um, been to that house or had anything to do with um, those people. I was certainly not um, associated with them in any other way. And then several months later, there was a, a brutal murder that took place in that home. Um, as you said, uh, Ed House and Melanie Taylor and a couple of others in their group uh, took a claw hammer 
to Alan Taylor's head while he was asleep. Absolutely horrific stuff. And, you know, the rest of their life in a cage is too good for them, as far as I'm concerned. But um, I certainly had nothing to do with the Aryan nations and neither, neither did anyone else within the United Patriots Front. And it should be said that the reason this murder took place, not that there is any reason for murder, but it wasn't to do with some sort of nationalist Nazi politics. It was because they wanted to collect a life insurance policy. It yeah. was a, a financial crime. Well, these things usually come back to money or some sort of greed issue, and that's what it was. They wanted his house, Melanie and uh, the, the new guy, Ed House, wanted to... Uh, get the life insurance and get the house, so they killed him. Well, and they tried to get away with it, and they didn't. Now let's turn to uh, your activism. And as you mm. said, you're, you're pretty much a, a one-man uh, show a lot of the time in Perth, and a lot of your, your activism, it does make its way over to us here in the, the East. This was some while ago, you were confronted by a Muslim student at, at Curtin University. Uh, she obviously recognised you. How did that uh, transpire? Yeah. Uh, A.M. Muhammad was the young lady's name. Um, she was a regular at uh, countering a lot of the rallies that we had. So um, the Reclaim rallies and a few other ones that we had in the Perth CBD. She was always there on, on megaphones and carrying on. And she, she, knew, she knew me. A few of them have got to know who I am um, over the years. And I have a degree at Curtin University. And on this particular day, I was there just actually getting some information about a postgraduate degree that I was looking at doing, and I was wearing a Pauline Hanson t-shirt. And yeah, <laughs> you know, people say, oh, you did it to provoke. Yeah, yeah, pretty much I did. I don't care. I mean, I get provoked when I see people walking around in green t-shirts too, but I don't, you know, go acting like a psychotic lunatic <laughs> about it. Um, and uh, I, had, I was walking up a flight of stairs actually, and they were there engaged in some sort of socialist activity, they were handled, handing out pamphlets or something, and I had to walk right through the middle of them. And I was like, oh, here we go, I knew something was going to happen. And then once I'd passed them, I just heard the heckling in the background, and so I just got my phone out and started filming, and the rest is what you saw on the video. Um, yeah, she was just demanding that I leave the university, and I had no right to be there, and Muslims are sick of it, and all this sort of stuff. But, yeah. And uh, campus security got involved? Yeah, they did, they did, and she was portrayed as the victim, of course. Um, you, you know, Anne Alley, the uh, federal Labor member, yes, for, uh, Cowan over here. She she got on the night on the news that night and said he knew what he was there for, and he's done this sort of thing before, and he was there to provoke, and you know, let's all cry for the for the poor Muslim student. But um, that's what the media does. That's what yeah, even about. though you were there for a specific reason, a legitimate reason to be at the oh, university. Yeah, that's right. I was there going about my personal lawful business. Uh, other people chose to attack me verbally. Um, I remained calm, I believe, um, and I simply videotaped the exchange. And yet, they were the victims. It's, it's a bit like that thing that happened in America the other day, you know what I mean? The, uh, the gay black actor who paid those mm. people. He's the victim now, you know what I mean? He's the victim. And uh, it, was, it, felt, it feels a bit like that, you know, how she was portrayed as the victim and I did nothing wrong. Now, a video that you did on your Facebook page uh, went uh, viral over this summer. It was talking about uh, African crime in Perth because there were two pretty disturbing incidents that occurred in Perth over the, the Christmas new period on, on Boxing Day. There was a brawl at a shopping centre and then there was a New Year's Eve attack and the the video that you did describing these incidents it's it's got nearly half a million uh views and it certainly opened a lot of people's eyes and this again is the the melbourne centric uh person in me who thinks it's just a melbourne problem but as you said no this is happening elsewhere yeah and i was heavily censored that video a lot of people now can't see it on their new yeah video. it's hidden uh yeah. for graphic content yeah, and they limit the reach with a lot of stuff I've done since then because of that.
But uh, yeah, you're right. Um, people tend to think that these things are only in Melbourne and the bigger cities. But I've said before, Melbourne and Sydney haven't learned the lessons of Europe through through third world immigration. And Perth is not learning the lessons of Melbourne and Sydney. And we are just a few short years away from, I think we have one of the highest rates of, of third world Sudanese African immigration here at the moment, because we're a huge state, we're a huge city. And um, the numbers are being bolstered through through uh, this sort of immigration. Um, there's a suburb in, in Perth called Mirabuka um, and surrounding suburbs like Balga, which were once working class suburbs, white working class suburbs. They were always lower socioeconomic suburbs like uh, all cities have, but they were still white working class and they've become ghettos now. They've become no-go zones for uh, a lot of uh, white Australians to go to, uh, our vulnerable citizens, the elderly, uh, women can't can't walk through certain parts of these suburbs alone. Wow. Yeah, yeah. It's not just Melbourne that has that. We have it here too. And uh, over the sort of Christmas New Year uh, period, um, yeah, there was in the in the middle of the CBD. It's where a lot, of, actually, right where a lot of left wing rallies are held um, in in Forest Place, where this there was like a hundred of them, just mass brawl between two. Sudanese gangs, I don't know what it was, but then a few nights later that brutal attack took place um, and I was able to be put in touch with um, one of the victims of the attack who told me that it was um, those of Sudanese or African appearance who did it um, and it, it had to have been at least some of the people who were involved in that first brawl I believe because um, there's probably you know one major big group of Sudanese people in Perth. Hey, that's incredible that you've got ghettos and no-go zone uh, suburbs there in in Melbourne. We've certainly uh, got that uh, as well. Do you know? Obviously, this is the the difficulty in in tracing this, but how these these people from these these third world countries were able to settle in the, in these suburbs like that's that's the sort of thing we're talking well, about it, it it just sort of happens it doesn't just happen it, it's 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 deliberate it's our, our globalist governments deliberately put the burden of third world immigration onto the lower socioeconomic suburbs and those lower socioeconomic suburbs are the ones which by and large have working class patriotic people who don't want that immigration in the first place. The leafy green inner city suburbs where these progressives sit, you know, sipping their soy lattes and demanding mass third world immigration are predominantly white suburbs and they'll never see third world immigration. The third world immigration gets sent out to the lower socioeconomic suburbs of every city and every city has it. It's, it, it's Sydney's West, it's, um, I don't know the areas of Melbourne, you probably know better than me, but I'm sure that they are. Uh, is it Broadmeadows or places like the lower where they are? Tarnit, uh, Wyndham Vale, uh, Dandenong Noble Park, they're the, the suburbs in Melbourne where um, this crime problem is quite prevalent. Yeah, and it's, it's a conspiracy, I, I think. It feels like it is because, you know, we saw Karen Phelps take over the seat of, what was it, Wentworth from Turnbull. Mm. And and you know that that suburb will never see third world immigration. And these these elitist progressives who are always demanding it, yeah, that's the globalist agenda. You know, to flood the West with uh, mass third world immigration, and it seems to be those lower socioeconomic areas that that bear the brunt of it. And what I was getting at is that ordinary people notice uh, th this happening and it's very difficult for them to trace who is responsible because it's the federal government working with the state government with the local government to facilitate all of these multicultural programs and set up all these uh, uh, diversity centers it's it's it involves every single layer of of government working intri intricately together and before you know it the, the community's changed I, I don't know a lot about the mechanics of it or, or who does what. All I know is that there's an international um, push to sort of revolutionise Western civilization and change it into something that it didn't used to be. And when you import the third world to countries like Australia, Australia starts to become the third world. Uh, those people don't leave 
their culture and their ideology on the shores of Sudan uh, and, and come to um, countries like Australia westernized. They come here just as, uh, as radicalized uh, with ways of thinking, ways of be behaving, which are so totally different than our ways of thinking and, and, uh, and acting. But they have completely different perceptions, completely different expectations, values, uh, norms. And to think that you can just um, create this massive melting pot where you just throw people into a 21st, people from cultures which haven't changed or haven't evolved from, from Stone Age ways of living and throw them into a, a, 20, uh, a sort of 21st century uh, democracy, advanced country, and think that you're going to have social cohesion, uh, it's, it's, it's a fallacy and it just doesn't work. And multiculturalism is a divisive social policy and it's one that's ultimately failed us. We're, we're going to be seeing the consequences of it for, for years to come because it's it's been brewing for, for, for so many years and what's or uh, the immigration that's already happened here, the, the consequences are going to be continue to fe be felt for many years. Now, another bit of activism you engaged in over the summer was unveiling a It's OK to be White banner at a uh, Big Bash cricket match at, at Perth Stadium. Now, obviously this triggered the, the media and the, the cricket administration because all the, the sporting codes are now will embrace the, the social justice agenda. Now, it's always called a white supremacist slogan, even though the phrase was coined on 4chan, one of the messaging things to say, because it's uh, to basically see if people would react, like let the left would react negatively to that, because it should be a, a statement that everyone's agree with, that it's okay to be white. But mm. in this identity politics age, no, saying it's okay to be white, it's they consider it a form of white pride and, and white supremacy. And we saw the outrage when uh, Pauline Hanson tried to uh, put the motion up in the Senate and the, the, the government blamed an administrative error for supporting a what should be an anti-racist slogan. Yeah, yeah. Well, rather than saying, rather than that slogan being one which says, uh, you know, white people are superior, it's just simply saying we're not inferior. Because, um, in, you know, in, in Australia today, in all Western nations, we see that the, the cultures of of uh, ethnic minorities being promoted and celebrated and indigenous culture being promoted and celebrated and that's all well and good. But it just seems that when it comes to uh, European Australian heritage, there's always these notions of shame and guilt attached to it. And it was in the lead up to Australia Day that once again, they all come out and try to tell us how bad we are and how we should be ashamed of ourselves and Australia Day needs to be changed. And all that banner was, was a reminder to, to people that, you know what, you don't have to be ashamed of your national institutions and the national institutions which ultimately have their foundation in white Australia. It's okay to be white. You don't have to feel bad about it. You're not inferior. I wasn't saying you are um, superior. I was saying you're not inferior. Um, yeah, there's, there's this constant push to make people feel bad of their Anglo and, and continental European heritage and ancestry. And you're right. If the politicians are too gutless to to back Pauline Hanson making a, a bill to say that it's okay to be white, then it's going to be left up to people like me to just give the, the, the public a, a friendly reminder that it is okay to be white, and it is. Now, obviously, uh, you knew that uh, this would attract a lot of an att attention, and it's, it's funny that uh, Sporting Codes, they have uh, no hesitation in getting uh, political, you know, when it comes to, like, they have their, like, gay pride rounds and, and that sort of thing. But if you unveil a, like, r make a right-wing statement at a sporting event, they, they really uh, hate that. And so, obviously, when you unveiled this banner, you knew it was going to uh, attract the attention of the various uh, authorities who are at the ground. So can you uh, take us through what transpired uh, once the banner was unfolded? Oh, once the banner was unfolded, it lasted a couple of minutes and security were on to us. Um, the police were on ground, they came over too. We were escorted to the exits, we were given move-on notices. 
and we were told to leave the ground. And a couple of days later, I got a letter in the mail from Cricket Australia telling me that um, on this occasion they were prepared to give me a warning, but uh, if I did it again, that um, it'd be a permanent ban from the ground. But you're right; it's not. It's not that you're there against making political statements. It's just certain types of political statements because the sporting, the AFL, for example, and Cricket Australia are probably the most one of the most political organisations uh, in the country. You're right, they're always promoting some sort of feminist idealism, multiculturalism, Aboriginal round, um, the gay pride ones. There's, uh, you know, wasn't there something in, at, at a footy, at a, in St Kilda game about the toilets? Yeah, the yeah, uh, yeah, at their gay pride game, they, they turned uh, some of the bathrooms gender uh, neutral and... So maybe my banner should have said it's okay to be gender neutral. Maybe I would have got a bit further if I had done that. <laughs> yeah, oh, I, I doubt they would have come uh, down as hard. Now, obviously, the authorities there didn't like the the banner, but was there any feedback from? Because obviously, there's other spectators there. Did what was their reaction to it? They didn't on this night because it wasn't a very um, packed out game. But we did one once before, uh, stop the mosque uh, one. Uh, the guys did it in Melbourne, and then they sent yeah. the, they sent the banner to the, through the post here to us, and we did it the next week at, at, at a Perth game, and uh, yeah, we we copped a bit from the spectators uh, on that night. They were ripping it out of our hands and calling us racists and doing all the sort of stuff that they do. But uh, again, never about race, always about culture, always about cultural compatibility and the defence of Australian culture. And what obviously your Facebook page, it's it's gaining. A substantial amount of followers. Uh, what what feedback did you get through Facebook uh, following the banner? Well, I think that I think the reach uh, had been limited on them uh, because of the African video that went viral. I think that the reach on my future videos has been uh, limited, but um, that's Facebook. You know, that's um, what Facebook has done, and the way they censor and silence right-wing voices is, is, is a crime. It's a crime against humanity, and it's something that needs to have something done about. Um, and the only way I see that ever changing is through some sort of massive revolution. What Facebook did is they, they revolutionised culture. By re they revolutionised the way um, human beings interact with each other socially. They didn't only revolutionise it, they monopolised it. And then they set down the ground rules about how you can use it and what you can say. And when you have that much power, you can you can change the world. You can bend the world into a certain way of thinking. And if conservatives say anything that's contrary to their globalist worldview, then they'll label it as hate speech and shut you down. Blair's gone. Neil's gone now. I really have no confidence that my page will last um, any any you know extensive amount of time. It'll be shut down before too long. The only way out of this I can see is some wealthy um, tech, some billionaire who has an interest in this to, to make some sort of a platform to rival Facebook might be the only answer. Well, I keep saying to the, the Patriots, go to minds.com or, or gab.ai, the, the free speech social media, but it seems that everybody's still either dependent or just... We are. Yeah, on Facebook, and or that's where the the masses still are, and so you're forced into still using the platform. Yeah. I, I still hold out hope that Facebook, if they just continue censoring people and handing out uh, thirty day bans all the time, that it's going to be uh, a tipping point. But there's still there's so many major corporations which throw money at Facebook, who harvest uh, users' data to to do. Uh, to use it for their their marketing thing, it's 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 basically the the big the big players the where there's money changing hands. That's why Facebook still got so much power. Certainly has, certainly has. It's too much power for one organisation. Don't really know what more to say about that other than that it's a, it's a complete scam. Uh, I don't know why social media has such a strong left wing leaning. Um, I just hope one day that something can be done that can change. 
Oh, also, who has a lot of power is still the, the mainstream media, and of course they didn't like uh, your banner at the, the cricket as well. And uh, Channel 10, Network 10, they decided to uh, call you a, a white supremacist, and you've actually decided to take legal action against them, which is, that's a pretty... Uh, like, obviously, it's pretty outrageous slander to, to say that, but going through legal warfare, that's a, that's a pretty grueling process. I know that uh, Blair Cottrell for a while was considering uh, suing various media out outlets for uh, attributing the portrait of Hitler in every classroom comments, but he's obviously got other uh, battles that he didn't end up pursuing at. So, first of all, like... Why have you decided to state, take this step and you're sort of aware of how difficult it's going to be, the process? I'm not sure that it is. Uh, the legal advice I've been given is that I've got a pretty strong case here. I've found a way to sort of get through. I don't want to give too much away, but I've found a way to sort of get through this without so much of the financial burden. You can't call someone a white supremacist or a Nazi just because you don't like the things they say. You can't call them those things just because you have a different political perspective um, than they do. It's wrong. And mainstream media, media organisations need to be taught that it's wrong. And they're not going to get away with this. Uh, it was a gross breach of their journalistic standards. Uh, I think what happened was it was a long weekend, it was um, Australia Day, their main editorial staff might not have been there, and they've just let this one slip through to the keeper, and they've come out and they've said, white supremacist Dennis Hutz. Now, I have never in my time in this movement made any statement which comes remotely close to saying that white people are superior than anybody else, or that other races should be subservient to white people that is the definition of white supremacy my fight has always been uh, about the uh, defense of australian culture the defense of western values i think western civilization western democratic values are the best in the world and it's never been about a person's race and uh, channel 10 should not have said that and they are not going to get away with it yeah and it's good that you've decided to take this. It's a courageous uh, decision, and I definitely hope that you win. Um, uh, there's also uh, Gavin McGuinness in the United States. He's trying to, well, taking the, the Southern Poverty Law Center uh, to uh, court in a defamation case for, for basically labeling him and the, the Proud Boys as uh, far-right extremists. And if these, your case and Gavin's case is, is one, then it's certainly, and I should also mention that the Covington uh, Catholic Boys case where they're suing the, the Washington Post for $250 million. Uh, dollars and if these cases succeed it's going to it's going to tell the the media that they can't just smear whoever they like or think that they can just write, uh, write the news how how they want to uh, want, want it to be seen that they actually have to be factual because at the moment they they just think they can get away with with things and up until now they have they have uh, and social media is that's the, probably one good thing about it. It's, it's given voices to people to fight what the mainstream media have always done. But um, yeah, you're right. They, uh, they can't get away with that. They just can't go around labeling people with these highly derogatory, highly, highly offensive terms just for their ratings and just to sensationalize a story, sensationalize uh, an incident when it was anything but that, you know? How would you best describe your views? Obviously, I, I don't think I've met anyone who is an actual white supremacist, but like in the nationalist community, there's a diversity of views. There's civic nationalists, uh, white nationalists. Obviously, you're quite critical of migration from the, the third world. And where would you pinpoint your exact political beliefs? Yeah, it's, it's not something that really can be pigeonholed, I don't think. Um, like I said before, I've always just felt a conservative political uh, standpoint on, on political on societal issues. Um, I believe that the values um, which were born in the in the Western democratic tradition are the ones which have served the world the best. 
and I believe that immigration should be limited to countries which have that same shared social and political understanding. Does it mean that they should be all be white? I've never said that. Um, I'm not. I'm not a, a white nationalist in that in that sense. I actually have um, kids who uh, are part Maori, and so again, when Channel Ten called me uh, a white supremacist, I, I was quite offended by that, quite humiliated by that, uh, being the father of kids who have uh, a part Maori heritage. So how I would describe myself is really just, um, it, it's a cliche, but just a patriotic Australian, really, who stands in, in defence of, of Australian culture and Australian tradition and, and doesn't want to see uh, our, our norms and values uh, eroded by immigration from countries that don't share those same values and norms and by the progressive left wing in our own country who are all about cultural revolution. That's really all they're about. They're not about... Uh, humanitarianism, that's a lie when they tell you that they're about cultural revolution and I stand opposed to them more than anything else. Now to cap off your busy summer of activism, you also confronted the local Invasion Day protesters in Perth. Now I, I obviously believe that the, the Melbourne Invasion Day protesters, they put on the, the biggest show and uh, this year the authorities didn't like or patri patriots wanting to uh, raise the Australian flag anywhere in the in the CBD, but you managed to get a bit closer. So, uh, what was what was that like, and what did you hope to achieve? I didn't really confront them. The media said that as well, but I was really just went along to have a look, and I was standing there, and again I was recognised. I was actually recognised by some of the members of Socialist. Um, Socialist Alliance, WA, who are affiliated with the Fremantle Council. Uh, they saw me and they alerted some of the Aboriginal people who came over and started calling me a white supremacist. And that's when it erupted into what you saw on um, the TV, on the news, and, and that's when Channel 10 called me a white supremacist. If anyone hasn't seen that, I'll put the link to it in the comments section of your, um, of your video here. But... Um, yeah, Melbourne was huge. The Melbourne one was huge. Melbourne, everything's huge in Melbourne compared to Perth. Um, they wanted to kill me, though. I mean, if it wasn't for those coppers there, I would have had the actual crap kicked out of me at the very least. Um, I felt that my life was in danger. I had, like, a hundred people trying to, like, mob me and beat me up and all kinds of stuff. And yeah, I didn't say a word to anybody. I just went along, I stood my ground. I mean, it's, it's all very well when we hold rallies, like Reclaim rallies and other kinds of rallies that we hold, for them to come along. Anarchists, leftists, so look, uh, quite often it's indigenous, but not always, and just heckle and abuse and act like, you know, morons the way they do. We all know how they act. But they are so indignant when we show up at one of theirs. It's like we're the worst people in the world. And they just have no sense of balance or it's such a double standard, you know. They think that we're so immoral for going along to their rally, but they, they come to ours every time without question to heckle and abuse us. Um, absolute hypocrites they are, these people. Absolute hypocrites. Well, they think it should be their safe space. And obviously they think that you're evil racist Nazis and so you're not allowed your freedom of speech, but they are because they believe that they're moral. That's how that's how it works. And yeah, we had Ricky Turner here in in Melbourne uh, mm. raise the Australian flag, and yeah, it was the same. Like if the police weren't there, they would have probably killed him. It was called fake news oh, yeah. that he was lynched. But oh. if the if the police hadn't been there, uh, what would have happened? Yeah, um, that's that's certainly how I felt uh, on the day. They were very angry. Um, it was mob mentality taking over. And uh, they were ready to uh, do what do their worst to me. If it wasn't for the coppers, uh, I would have been in all sorts of trouble. Now, one problem that's been happening in Perth over the recent weeks is that of militant vegans who've been harassing local farmers there. And there was that one confrontation that was was captured by 
uh, or sent to Seven News of a farmer uh, firing uh, shots to get a vegan activist off his property. He uh, confronted him in, in, in his car and they are getting really more more aggressive if you eat meat you're a you're a murderer and they're uh harassing and, uh, and abusing uh, not just uh, uh adults but children in restaurants for for eating meat but it seems to be wa that's where all the the vegans are uh mm. not even melbourne's that bad i don't know what it is about wa uh that, that has this sort of large vegan uh community but you're right, the way they go about it. And there are, I've seen some other vegan groups who are actually even condemning them, these radical vegans, for the way they're going about it because they, they think that these guys are doing a disservice to them. But, um, yeah, they storm restaurants. They, uh, you know, start throwing salt and pepper shakers around. They abuse children and call them murderers for eating hamburgers. They go down to farmers' properties and they film them and all this sort of stuff that you've seen. I'm not sure what that thing was with the journalist. They attacked the journalist uh, who was doing something in a shopping centre the other day. and Apparently he had some connection to being anti-vegan or so they thought. Um, it's only a matter of time before I cross paths with them though. And I don't know what's going to happen when that happens. So the, we never know where they're going to be. That's the thing. They don't they don't advertise their, their sort of activism. But uh, I have got a little bit of information on where I might be able to find Mr. James Warden, the, uh, the leader of Direct Action Everywhere in Perth. So I may be paying him a visit sometime very soon, so keep your eyes open for that one. Yeah, they certainly do need to be confronted because they're, they're basically terrorising innocent people. Like, Why do they feel so empowered to to do this i mean obviously the leftist politicians they they enable these radicals so much that they they feel empowered to take this extreme action but i i don't know for a fact but i'm sure that uh mark mcgowan's not a not a vegan what what steps is he taking against these activists i mean he would know how important agricultural farming is to uh wa is he going to finally uh stand up to the the people that he's been enabling all these years well he has said something um in the news he he, he was uh, condemning of them but that's probably about as far as as he'll go yeah, it's just another branch of leftism, leftism really, isn't it? It doesn't matter what their cause is, whether it's um, pro-gay rights or pro-refugees or animal activism, any form of sort of activism they engage in, you'll never get formal, rational, constructive, inter intelligent debate uh, or an exchange of ideas. All you'll ever get is this sort of almost criminal violent and, and, and sort of confrontational um, sort of action. Um, that seems to be the only way they know how to operate because they're guided by emotion. Uh, facts and logic don't seem to matter to these people. It's all just violence fueled emotion which sort of guides everything that they do. Well, they think that everyone, every human is committing murder on a, on a daily basis by, by eating meat. So they think mm. that this is a form of mass murder. And, that, and that's why they, they, they feel that they're justified in, in behaving this way, abusing just, uh, just ordinary people. And of course, it's been pointed out that this is the, the worst way to convince people of your cause to basically go and harass people and, and say that they're the worst humans <laughs> Well, well, they believe that the human race is itself a a bad uh, race, and so that that that's why they're they're willing to abuse anybody and everybody. Well, only some only some races within the human race, it would seem, because <laughs> when you look at you look at halal slaughter and the way certain other races treat animals around the world, and, and they're silent on it. It's the same as you know violence per perpetrated by brown skin depressed man. Yeah, just, I wonder if they've gone to a kebab shop <laughs> and protested. Yeah, you'll never get it. You'll never get it. It'll be white, white owned restaurants only. Yeah, well, it's certainly something to, to keep an eye out for. The The last thing we need is yet another uh, leftist uh, front to, to fight against. Absolutely. 
Well, I've appreciated you, Dennis, uh, coming on the, the show today to discuss your your activism. Like I said, you've had a, a busy summer and a lot of people have appreciated what you've done and uh, especially over, over in the West. Thanks, mate. Good to be with you. Thanks for having me. All right, everybody, that's the show for today. I have another update on the Visas for the Deplorables tour, which still aims to feature Miley Yiannopoulos, Gavin McGuinness and Tommy Robinson. Mainstream media reported yesterday that Miley had been banned from Australia. This is fake news. None of the three speakers have been told they are banned from Australia, but it's clear uh, from this drawn out process that the Home Affairs Department and Immigration Minister David Coleman in particular are trying to frustrate this process and, dare I say, attempt to make the tour unviable. So tour dates have had to be pushed back another fortnight to begin in Perth on March 23. I'd encourage anyone who cares about free speech and open debate in Australia to contact David Coleman's office or sign the online petition on the Deplorables website. Let's hope that there's one debate we are allowed to have in Australia, and that is the Conversation About Feminism tour featuring bad feminist Roxanne Gay and factual feminist Christina Hoff Summers in late March. Please go to the promoter's website, thisis42.com slash feminist to book your place. Our editor at large, Steel Archer, is currently at the latest Liberty Fest conference in Perth, which we are a sponsor of. When Steel returns from Liberty Fest, he'll be joining me here in Melbourne permanently. He's going to be starting his detonation program here in the studio which is very exciting and it continues the expansion of the the Unshackled's production. Remember that the Unshackled can only continue and expand with the support of our followers. We've upgraded to a new web server and the site now has a brand new flashy look which has increased our expenses so it's important you find a way to support us. You can pledge over at patreon.com slash the Unshackled and directly via paypal me slash the Unshackled. We also have our premium membership option on our website, theunshackled.net slash support options slash premium membership. We are still waiting on our subscribe star account to be approved. It seems like we're the last ones to be approved, so hopefully that will be launching shortly. So thanks once again for your company, and we'll see you next show. Thanks for tuning in to The Unshackled Waves. Please visit theunshackledwaves.net for all the ways to subscribe and follow the show. Don't forget to pick up your free ebook at theunshackledbattlefield.net and keep checking out theunshackled.net for all the latest news and commentary.